Hello, and welcome back to the Talk Toys 2022 wrap up. So, uh, this is part two. If you've missed it, part one, we discuss the best games and the best movie we have played and watched, respectively, this year. So, this is part two, where we'll be discussing a few other categories. So, without further ado, uh, myself and my three guests are going to dive in to discussing the best TV shows we watched in 2022. So, as with the other ones, these aren't necessarily TV shows that came out this year. These are just the best one we've watched. But as it happens, yet again, my pick for TV show this year did uh, come out this year, partly. And that is Better Call Saul. Uh, now, because I am a professional, I knew that there's a chance that Tim would have chosen the Better Call Saul as well. But I also knew that Tim would have thought that I'd have picked this and would have thus picked a different one. So knowing that he'd have picked a different one, I stuck to my original one because I knew that he had a backup. See, Your I'm all... Also... have played out. That yeah. is exactly what happened. There we go. Yeah. See, that is... Ah. Oh. Anyway, um, so... Better Call Saul, chances are you've probably heard of it by now. It is a prequel, technically, to Breaking Bad, which was itself a phenomenal TV show. Uh, whereas Better Call Saul obviously follows Saul Goodman or Jimmy McGill, the uh, the lawyer that you know the runs into the dynamic duo in Breaking Bad. Uh, <clears throat> and to be honest, this is a series I started watching when the first season came out. And kind of dropped after the first season. I I wasn't really feeling it. I wasn't really that into it. And I was like, hey, this is probably fun. Oh, season two is out. No, I'm good, thanks. Um, then at the start of the year, uh, uh, my nephew just casually mentioned, oh, hey, Better Call Saul's getting really good. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll give it a go. Um, and what transpired was I could quite confidently say six seasons of one of the best TV shows I've ever watched. It's, yeah. it, it, it is absolutely the definition of a slow burn. Um, if you just went into it watching the first season, you know, I, I don't blame anyone for dropping it at that. I did myself. However, if you stick with it, you will find an incredibly well-written, like, drama um, that doesn't even necessitate knowing Breaking Bad very much to enjoy. But if you do, it adds to it. But yeah. honestly, it stands on its own so well. And I know Tim has said this as well. I would even wager, arguably, outshines Breaking Bad, especially in some regards. It is... Genuinely think that. It's... I had more fun watching Better Call Saul once it got going than I did Breaking Bad. And I thought it's saying a lot because I really mm. enjoyed Breaking Bad, but... Oh. There are certain things that it does and certain ways that it treats characters that are so interesting and you can just sit there and watch it and it, it just, when things start clicking and when things start ramping up, it is one of the best TV shows that uh, I've ever seen. It's it's very rare when a prequel or a tie-in thing is, is made and the director or creator will say, oh, this will like... Help, you know, this will make you see the original in a whole new light. And usually it's not. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. there's one reference. Better Call Saul, by the end, absolutely recontextualizes about half the series. There are events, there are people, there are locations that... I'm going to start watching Breaking Bad next year, again. And I'm looking forward to it because I'll be looking at different parts of this in a completely new light because of the history that BCS shines a light on. It's... Yes. It's such a so, good experience. I did that in my tons of lightest week last couple of weeks. <laughs> I rewatched the entirety of Breaking Bad after just watching Better Call Saul. And it does a lot of things. First of all, I couldn't wait for Saul to appear because when I first watched Breaking Bad, it was just, oh, the lawyer guy, okay, he's kind of funny. But mm. it really makes you want to like see him on screen and see him interact with people. It also made me look at... Um, Walter as more of a dickhead like he, yeah. he, he just comes across after watching Better Call Saul not that there's anything particularly in Better Call Saul that paints him in this way but because you've had kind of a different viewpoint of everything happening it, it just really contextualizes how like how of water he is and how he's not he's not someone that should be like revered so and things like um 
I mentioned this before, but the way that I feel like maybe they learned a lesson with Skylar and wrote <laughs> Kim as a really likable female character who is like yes. one of the best, most interesting characters that you really do support and makes choices that make sense. Um, and then, yeah, it made you hate Skylar a bit more when you watch Breaking Bad as well. Also, Better Call Saul uh, elevated my favourite character from Breaking Bad, which was Gus. I loved Gus. Breaking Bad just adds quite a few more layers to that man and it's yeah it adds layers in a good way like it adds mm. layers to mike as well and like you were saying before yeah. there's so many things that market themselves as prequels and stuff that are like oh it's gonna add things and then it's just kind of a cheap fan servicey thing but this is nothing of the sort because like you said it stands on its own and it genuinely does just add things mm. and make you kind of appreciate the story even more like it, it, it's genuinely one of the only ones i can think of where it was necessary there's so other things, so many other like prequels and reboots and shit like that. There's like, it, why does it exist? It doesn't need to exist, but this isn't one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unless anyone else has any additional comments, we'll move over to Tom's nomination for Best TV Show 2022. So, I um, I think TV this year, um, with the exception of Bear Call Saul, which I haven't watched, but I've watched the first two series been somewhat weak uh, I thought hmm. um, so it's more something I've watched recently that really was interesting to me um, which was um, a kind of docu-series it was only three episodes long called Trainwreck Woodstock 99 oh yeah so I've talked to you a bit about it recently not much but basically it just talks about um, the Woodstock concert, like the last one that was in uh, 1999 and basically how much of a train wreck it was. Like, it does what it says on the tin. Um, well, what was interesting is how they talked about the previous Woodstock. Well, there was two previous Woodstocks officially. The one before was a bit of a mess. It was really wet. Nothing particularly went bad, but it was just a washout. And obviously there was the famous one, which has left a lasting cultural cultural impact. Well, mm. on the world, we talk about it in the UK, America, it's a bigger thing. It was all, it was to do with counterculture, hippies and being anti-war and stuff. And they had some of the best acts on. Mm. Um, now, <laughs> what what's interesting with... Woodstock in 99 was they talked about the bands that people were into then. So the two big ones which I think kind of set the tone were Corn and Limp Bizkit. Oh yeah, shout Frederick out to Frederick Durst. Durst. <laughs> no, not shout out to Fred Durst, he's a dickhead. <laughs> not after that, you will, you will see him in a different light after this as wow. more of a dickhead. So it kind of talks about where people are at because I think the organisers really thought it was going to be another festival of love and peace. And they put it on this ex-Air Force base, um, which was completely tarmacked. They commercialised all, like, the sales and stuff. So, like, all the food stalls were marking up. They were selling water for $4. Ooh. And this was in 1999. Ooh. That's a lot now. Never mind then. So everyone was dehydrated. The food was ridiculously expensive. They didn't have proper plumbing. They outsourced all the plumbing, the porter loos and stuff. So they were overflowing. And the people of the time especially men, and I think it really points this out, but like teenage boys and young men, they were very much at the time into things like American Pie and stuff. They did not have a positive outlook on how to treat women. And it really comes out in the documentary. But mm. lastly, I just want to talk about Corn and Limp Bizkit. They started mosh pits, and it's almost like I spoke to someone in work about this. It's almost like Frederick Durst knew 
he was controlling the crowd. He knew he had a sense of power there, and he could have calmed things down. But instead, he chose to release havoc. And ultimately, what happened was the people were tearing down the sound stage. People had to be evacuated. In the end, the state troopers came in because the whole place was ablaze Ooh. when everyone was upset. So upset at how the organisers had treated them. So it was really a take on commercialization and everything. So, yeah, it was um, quite eye-opening, to be honest. Kind of similar to uh, Travis Scott with the... Uh... Yes, yeah. yeah. In a way, I think, I think a lot of people have compared... Um, I know this is more recent, but they've compared it to Fire Festival. Oh, you know, how yeah. bad they turned out, really. So, well, I yeah. I can say this: I've seen Corn and Limp Bizkit live uh, a few years ago, and yeah, I mean, I I don't know how to be judge. I'm not being too judgmental, but Fred just did not look good. He did not look good. He looked you know, uh, really beardy and nothing wrong with beards, but this was like really raggedy and unkempt and I was like, oh, is the dude actually okay? Is it? Oh. And, you know, I... One of the things that got me was they didn't get Fred Durst on the documentary, but there was like footage of him leaving backstage and they asked him, you know, oh, look what's going on, you know, what do you think of it? And the first thing he says is, it's not my fault, you know, I... And he was basically, like, say, absolute being a dick about it. Not not even condemning it, really, just hmm. being an absolute dick about it, relinquishing all blame, and yeah, yeah. So, there you go, I'll, I'll finish on that. Well... It sounds like an interesting documentary. Um, Tim, would you like to nominate your TV show that you watched this year next? But mine kind of came out this year. So, as Rid said, I um, I did watch Better Call Saul, so I picked a backup. Uh, and this was actually my first, so Better Call Saul was my backup in case someone... Well, no one's going to say this one, but anyway. I, it, it occurred to me as we started filming today that I think I mentioned this show before, but Season two came out this year, so I feel like I'm perfectly justified to bring it back up. But the um, single series that I enjoyed watching most this year was season two of Russian Doll. Russian Doll is a Netflix show starring Natasha Leon, who is brilliant. She's uh, really good. She's in lots of things. Uh, it's the first season, which I think I did talk about a couple of years ago. It came out in 2019. And um, it's kind of a new take on the time loop kind of trope. where Groundhog Day kind of thing, yeah. That, exactly, that kind of thing where she keeps dying um, in different ways and it kind of becomes this philosophical search for why it's happening. Yeah. Uh, turns out she finds another person who is happening too and they kind of figure it out. Season 2 takes a different route. Um, they're no longer dying. They've they've gone past that. They're not dying and going in the loop anymore. That's good. Yeah, it uh, it comes up with something fresh. So in this in this season, what happens is uh, she gets on a train uh, on the subway. It's based in New York. Uh, and what happens is when she gets off the train, uh, she's gone back in time. Mm. So she oh. gets off the train and suddenly it's 1982. And obviously, that in and of itself is uh, a bit of a shocking thing. Um, but as she walks around and converses with people and goes to where she used to live at that time, she looks in the mirror and discovers that not only has she gone back in time, uh, she is her mother. So she goes back in time and oh. becomes her mother in 1982. Oh. In 1982, uh, it gets even more crazy. So in 1982, her mother was pregnant with her. So she goes back in time and finds herself in the body of her mother who is pregnant with her. <laughs> wow. She goes back and forth. So she is, when she goes back on the train, she does come back and forth. And it becomes this kind of story of because her mother was a bad mother, not very, um, not very attentive, really kind of destructive as a person. So it becomes this kind of... Um, acceptance of things that happened to her in her past 
I don't want to say too much because mm. uh, I, don't want, I don't want to give things away again. It's the kind of thing you want to go into mm. not knowing much. Um, but she tries to make changes to the past so that things are better in her childhood and it doesn't really pan out. So it becomes this kind of acceptance of the things that have gone on in the past. And um, it ends up uh, where she goes back for the last time. She is literally giving birth to herself. So she sits, lies there on the train, like in literally the subway, giving birth to herself. And then she's carrying around her own baby, which is her, uh, <laughs> looking around to try and find somewhere better for her to spend her childhood. And yeah, that's when it kind of comes to a uh, emotional high point. And she kind of decides what is the best thing to do with the baby version of her. Uh, it's really good. It has a fucking stellar soundtrack. Uh, Pink Floyd, um, um, the fucking loads of 80s music. Ah, nice. And, era appropriate. Uh, very era appropriate. And yeah, it's 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 a uh, highly recommended uh, season. It, it somehow managed to do as well as the first one in my eyes, which I didn't think it would. Nice. I, I, I think it's on my list... Russian doll, so I will. Uh, well, I said the first season. I I haven't bothered with the second season, but now that you've said that, it makes me reconsider. Mm. Right. Well, uh, we are on to the last TV nomination, and that is Dan. Would you like to yeah. nominate your TV series, Dan? Oh yes, I will. And it is. It's gotta be uh, Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, mm. which is on Netflix. Um, so this one is like, it's it's kind of like um the old um uh Twilight Zone or Black Mirror kind of an thing anthology, where it's like an anthology. That's the word. Thank you, Red. Uh, but this one is like kind of gothic in the gothic tradition, and it's uh, yeah, honestly, it's just a treasure trove. Uh, like each episode is 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 on its it's on its own but they each hold up really well and i was i kind of went in um i know i like guillermo del toro's work and so i was i was quite confident it'd be be pretty good but uh it actually surpassed my expectations and and yeah there's all sorts of different episodes and uh um but uh it, it is good because um you know, there's some Lovecraft stories in there. You've got, um, uh, but some other unknown ones. And uh, uh, what, what, what can I say? Because uh, I'll I'll pick what a few of my favorite episodes. And one was called um, the Outside, and uh, and it's uh, so it's about this uh, uh, a woman uh, played by Kate Mikuchi. Uh, I think she was in like the Big Bang Theory at oh, one good. point, one of the awkward um, girlfriends um, they've had. But uh, yeah, and it's like this. Basically, she plays as this really awkward woman, and she's like really insecure at, at a workplace. In like, it doesn't really say what year. It could be nineties, could be eighties, or whatever. But um, and she really wants to fit in with her group, and they're all like kind of. Uh, the other women are, you know, tr traditionally sort of attractive. If you, if you, you know, and talk about, uh, you know, what husbands and things like that. And she's trying to fit in, and she just doesn't fit in, you know. And uh, without going too much, but uh, yeah. And and anyway, so she noticed they all have this lotion, and she's like, oh, I, I need this. I need this to fit in. And she keeps rubbing it on, and it just gets worse for her. And and it, it it it's uh, and, and and it goes into a complete different uh, to somewhere where you wouldn't expect it. Uh, but it was really good. That was really good. But um, there was also um, an episode called The Viewin, and that was directed by Panos Cosmatos, and he um, directed uh, Mandy and Beyond the Black Rainbow. Ah, uh, yeah. So and I really love uh his stuff like he's really it's really trippy really weird and really over over the top with uh, like 
uh, experience, visual experience, you know. And, uh, and it was great, that one. It was like, you had the guy from, um, uh, you had Peter Weller, that's his name. And he's like, uh, if you've ever seen Robocop, that's him. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, he's yeah. in it. You got Eric Andre in it. And, and, um, and yeah, so there's uh, that one is about this, like, uh, there are all these, like, people that have been chosen to go to this part, you know, party you know uh like a uh, a vip party you know with just them and it's really tense and it's kind of builds up it's a build up of like they're all really talented in their own certain things and he's like right well i've i'm 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 gathering you're all here to view something kind of thing and it's really weird and and uh ah but there's also another one uh and and uh, called the murmuring and that's got um andrew lincoln in it who's the you know from walking dead and and this is no spoiler basically they 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 had a they're ornithologist so they're like basically into birds and stuff oh, and yeah, researching yeah, about them right you know and uh so they're researching it's set in the 1950s and they're looking into birds um uh these certain type of birds but during behind that basically their daughter uh the baby daughter sort of died the a year or two ago and they're sort of really just you know coping trying to get away from that grief and just focusing on to their work but while this is happening some strange things are happening in the house and and uh and uh, you find it's one of those things where the there you know it's a ghost story, but you find that the the ghosts aren't actually scary. It's actually the people themselves dealing with their trauma that is the most scary, I think. You know, and uh, and um, yeah, honestly, there's eight episodes, and those are just three out of uh, many episodes that are really good. And um, uh, you should all uh, uh, ch- check them out. Um, yeah, I've and... I've heard really good things about the series. Yeah. It's a, it's another one that, much like everyone's nominations, barring mine, obviously, uh, I, I've all got on my list of oh nice, I'll give that a watch. Also, um, something I've realised: all of our nominations are Netflix. Uh, yeah, she went full Netflix yeah. this year. Netflix. Yeah, unintentionally, Netflix. obviously. Uh, I mean, technically, Better Call Saul is ABC, I think. It started ABC, but then Netflix took it over, didn't they? Oh, oh okay, that's how it works. Right. Yeah, well, it is all Netflix. And talking about Netflix, sometimes Netflix uh, have anime on them, so we're going to nominate anime next. God, that was a smooth one. Fucking yeah, hell, yeah, I'm good. I'm um, right, okay, so uh, next one is the best anime we saw in 2022. Yet again, this doesn't have to be a 2022 anime. It could be anything. So, my nomination is not a series that came out this year, I don't think. Uh, but the So, I watched both season one and two, that's the complete of it, which is High School Girl. Um, so, this, I believe, actually might be a quote-unquote Netflix anime. I know that Netflix... Yeah, ever, it is on Netflix. I've not seen it. They before, have a so. weird thing where a Netflix anime sometimes means a completely separate studio funded and created it, and then Netflix said, hey, can we buy the rights to that and then netflix are like yay look like for example there's another netflix series called neon genesis evangelion uh it is it is a netflix original series guys yeah it's <laughs> it's not but, yeah. but they paid the right anyway so high school girl um is set it's set over several years but it kind of starts out in the mid 80s uh in japan in the arcade scene and follows, unfortunately I can't remember their names, but it follows a boy who is very much into games and loves going to the arcade. And one day he bumps into a girl who doesn't talk, but is incredibly good at Street Fighter 2. And she's just ten. she's just unbeatable. Um, and so he kind of keeps bumping into her, and a sort of, a, a sort of friendship slash romance kind of blossoms. Um, and the series basically kind of follows them both growing up through the years. So it's kind of told through the perspective of the arcade scene in Japan, which I really loved. So 
for example, they meet when Street Fighter 2 came out, and then there's like a time skip and Street Fighter 2 Turbo is out, and then Virtua Fighter came as a, comes out, then Tekken, then Street Fighter 3, and it sort of, it follows a really interesting progression in that it's kind of the bond that keeps the two together, which is arcade games, even though they may drift oh. apart for like a year or two. You know, a new game will come out and they happen to meet each other again. And honestly, it's a really touching story of both kind of friendship and romance because there is a romance that blossoms, but it's not necessarily front and centre. It's more about kind of sharing a passion for games, but it kind of shows the social side that we never really particularly got much in the West. I know America had an arcade scene for a while, but... It's it's both kind of a gripping drama, basically, but also a really interesting look into the history of Japanese arcade games because you can kind of see, you know, what the feelings were at the time, how people felt about home consoles and, you know, ports of fighting games. And if you're into fighting games, there is there's so much. There's, uh, like, one of the first plot points is all about guile turtling in Street Fighter 2. And, ah, uh, it's... It's it's just like it's it's really enjoyable from start to finish. It is quite emotional, but also like you can tell the creators were really passionate about these games. It wasn't just a kind of thing they put on for an aesthetic. They they were clearly arcade nerds themselves. So yeah, just a really fun series. Yeah, it sounds very cute. I I like I like, I like the sound of that. Yeah. Uh, Right, on to... I am going to Tom's. ask you to defer me to last. On no. to Tim's, as no. I was saying. Tim's nomination for anime well, watched in 2022. Uh, my anime is from 2022. I'm going full normie route. Um, I'm saying Spy Family. Spy Family is very cute. It's very... It's, it's my favourite kind of anime because lately... There's so much fucking shonen stuff going on, and although there's lots of good shonen anime, it is it, it, it's been done so much, and uh, it, it gets tiresome. Whereas this kind of slice of life thing is also done quite a lot, but it doesn't get tiresome because there's always something. Um, it's more nuanced, I feel, because you kind of want to relate to the characters more than just watching big flashy fights. Mm. The Spy Family is just really well done. It's a breath of fresh air in my eyes because. All the characters are really just enjoyable. Um, it's it's not kind of let's just watch these people fight each other. It's got some interesting background stuff as well with the political climate and that. And then you put these kind of three characters together who find each other under the weirdest of circumstances and have these weird backgrounds and powers that neither of the other knows about. And every episode is just a delight to find out how they interact with each other. Um, Anya is just very, very adorable. And everything, when you kind of see things through her eyes, which I feel like the anime does, even though you're introduced to Lloyd first, the kind of father figure, you kind of get everything through Anya's eyes, which is kind of nice. It's kind of innocent. It's kind of... um, It's kind of childlike in in a very innocent and cute kind of way um so yeah I've, I've i've really been enjoying it um i watched the first part because it, it's all season one that's come out this year apparently but it's just in two different parts uh and i've just started part two now and they've introduced a dog and i feel like that's the best, best thing boy. you can do in an anime uh, best 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 dog bond a good boy uh and yeah i'm looking forward to more fun hijinks that you don't have to think too much about so i so... i've been reading the manga uh, so I haven't watched any of the anime myself, but I know that I am up to the the point of the end of season one in the manga, basically. And yes, I it's 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 quite a unique thing as well because it it's very wholesome and whimsical, but it does have its dark elements with sort of Lloyd's espionage world and sort of your being a an assassin. But mm-hmm. it's. It it never feels overly dark or anything, and it is often played for like humorous things. It, it it's a bit like Definitely. a comedy in a sense, but you know it's uh, yeah, it's a so, great series. So this was, I I had a hard choice this year. I'm I will talk about my one later, but uh, this was going to be one of the ones I was going to pick. 
but so I agree, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I kind of discovered it through the hype more than anything. Everyone was saying, oh, yes, watch this, watch this. Mm. Um, because everyone had read the manga, so it was really good. Um, one of the things I like most about it is the fact none of the characters know the truth about any of the others, apart from Anya, who knows, knows everything. That yeah. That her mother is an assassin and her father is a spy. But the fact that they keep it hidden from each other and they don't know and how that plays out is really great. You've got your like serious plots in there that, well, serious plots played in a kind of whimsical way, I guess. Mm. But you've also got your kind of filler as well. I feel with episodes quite often, they'll split them into bits, especially on the more fillery bits. And they're always really fun to watch. Even the Yeah, slice of life filler is good filler because it's yeah, just yeah. more of the same comfiness, isn't it? It's, it's character development at the end of the day. Uh, mm. Whilst in Shonen and stuff, it doesn't... It, it's it's infuriating. You're just like, oh, bring the... Po- Come on, advance the plot. But... Yeah. You don't want that. You just want to keep. You want to keep Ryan Danette. and I love the setting as well of uh, Berlin. Mm. Uh, yes, Berlin. Not Berlin. It's Berlin. not East like... versus West Germany. It's different. <laughs> well, it's it's weird. Then the it is. It's like it's like early twentieth century, mm. but at the same time, it's kind of modern. And yeah. it's a very nice, comfy setting. It, uh, I, I do like it, despite there being this like really worrying conflict on the horizon in the series. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Well, Tom, do you want to nominate yours now? Or... I'm going to wait for Dan okay. because okay. depending on what he picks now, I will choose mine. Dan, would you like to nominate your well, anime of 2022? Yeah. I'm gonna say Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Did you yeah. pick that, Tom? Well, this is exactly <laughs> where I've gone last. I mean, yes, you can on. you can pick the same ones if if you guys oh. you know. No, you can't. Okay. It's not allowed, right? It's against the talk toys rules. Exactly, you've got a prison. It's a, It's basically it's about um this um s- student who um isn't really a great student and basically he's cut off. Um, from his family and he's you know in, in due to certain events and yeah he's just surviving it in this really cutthroat futuristic city and uh, but then he befriends a team of edge runners and uh, it goes from there but um, yeah the the animation style is absolutely incredible um, and you know, and it, it, the story as well is really um, like towards the end. It was really gut wrenching, but it was. It, it's um, I think it's beautifully told, beautifully, beautifully animated as well, and uh, really, I, uh, yeah. I think the one thing the series does, which I didn't expect going in with it, is that it gives the characters sort of an incredible amount of depth, but. It doesn't linger very long on it. What well, sort yeah. of the the series really gets the cyberpunk aesthetic, which is that like everything's kind of temporary. Everything's just up to sort of getting the most out of the situation, and then moving on and like not looking back. You're and sort of and die young. yeah, like yeah. L- literally, it is all about sort of like consume to the most that you can consume, and then move on to the next thing that and like. Yeah, the the oh. series does an incredible job of sort of introducing you to some characters, but always leaving it a little bit in the air so that you don't know too much about them. I mean, even, it, you know, even yeah. David, the, like the main character, isn't... You never feel like anything overstays its welcome. If anything, yeah. by the end, it feels a little bit... I mean, I saw things online, because there's 10 episodes, and one of the biggest criticisms I saw online was like, why well, isn't there more? I want more, and yeah. it's like that. I think we, we even me, uh, me and you had this discussion as well. I mm. was thinking, oh, I wish there were more, and but to be honest, I think 
it's... that's kind of the vibe of cyberpunk yeah. though. i mean it's the the point is that you things know... are fast and and you don't really appreciate it until it's gone yeah and, and basically yeah, in that in that world really sort of like nothing is personal or kind of like you know, it lasts very long, so that's kind of the point of the series as well. It's meant to feel like, oh my god, wow, that was that was over quick. That that's the end. Oh, okay. But yeah, I think as well, it it, um, it brings. I'm more interested in the cyberpunk world now. I think, um, you know, the I mean, the, the last game was wasn't that you know it was everybody knows about the controversy, and I thought well that's it but people like well no no we can actually you know just because this project didn't do too well doesn't mean that you know this so now i'm thinking oh well they can actually do something good out of it so i have a bit of hope actually so i know the game did actually uh get a bit of a peak of sales after edge oh, runners came out it, it got massive numbers and it's still apparently the numbers are still pretty high wow. i think I think one of the good things brought with it, I think the characters in Edge Runners are a lot better than in the game. Oh, they're absolutely. A, they're far yeah. better written. I don't think they expected how well received Edge Runners would be. Mm. Um, and if they do do another series, obviously I think what they need to do is another cast of characters. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe it's to win something different with the with it. But what was interesting, it brought people back to the game, and the game has, in a big way, been quite fixed in uh, the time. It's far. It's still far from perfect, but there's a lot of stuff that's been fixed, and. I d- yeah. People came back to it with a fresh set of eyes and they really liked it. Now, me personally, I'm waiting for this expansion that's coming out and then I'm going to give it another set of eyes. Mm. But they're saying these days now it's a much better game and I think this is the this is what they needed to kind of kick give the it game a, off a game. reset. Uh but I think to be honest, I'm going to say Hats off to you know Studio Trigger for for making such a great uh, anime, and I kind of hope they do more. But if they don't, at least we still have these ten episodes, hmm. ten sweet, 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 incredible episodes. Yes, yes. Right. Well, on to the last nomination, which is Tom's anime of twenty twenty two. Right. So I was very much syncing with Dan and Tim's picks here. But um, there was another anime that really gripped me. It was early on in the year. Um, and I don't know how to sell it to you guys, because it really does sound generic on the face of it, but I really enjoyed it. And I will kind of give a love letter to it here. But it was uh, My Dress Up Darling. Hmm. So I watched that early in the year. And I think... What it comes off of is quite... Oh, it's waifu bait. Um, But what I went into it was one of the most... Like, the chemistry between the characters in this series really sold it for me. And it was a lot more of a realistic kind of romance than you see in a lot of anime. For one, it didn't really play up to archetypes too much in the main characters um they are quite unique they didn't go down the sundere route etc i think there is a side character that's like that but that's beyond the point but just to go into the plot a little bit it's um the show focuses on a guy who uh, he has a hobby and the hobby is making these little sort of china dolls and they're like it's quite in japan it's quite an oldy thing it's something older people are into these dolls a lot of people think they're quite creepy we have kind of equivalents in this country uh but he's really into these and the scene opens up and i think it's either a friend or a family member of his basically saying you're weird boy you shouldn't be doing that 
but he gets really into this and he feels as a result doesn't have any friends but he's really into making these dolls so one day he goes to school and he's using the sewing machines in school to make like little outfits for them and this girl walks in and she's the popular girl so he kind of sees her as not very approachable um but she sees what she he's doing and is instantly amazed um she herself is into cosplay so basically she ropes him in <laughs> into making a full size cosplay all this guy had done up to this point is make little outfits for these like medieval era dolls so it goes into how much intricacy he puts into these outfits for her and it explores their relationship throughout and how he comes to terms with this girl who is completely different to him um like gets on how he gets on with her and Honestly, it really tugs at the heartstrings, uh, this series. Um, if I compare it to something, Rind, it's not, obviously, it's not got the supernatural elements, but hmm. in terms of the romance, it's like Bunny Girl Senpai. Which was your nomination for last year. Yes, yeah. It's... Yeah, I honestly, I've, I've heard a lot of really good stuff about My Dress Up Darling, and as you were saying, that, like... A lot of people were surprised that it seemed just like another seasonal waifu anime, but sort mm. of brought a ton more to it that seemed to be written like from quite a, a sincere place and stuff. And yeah, I, I've i seen Marion like up there in terms of like current waifus as like, no, she's just generally like a really nice person that sort of, in I know a lot of the animation as well. Hmm. It's it's really good. It's done by uh, Cloverworks. Ah, yes. Who Clover. did Spy Family as well. And oh. they're quite good for, like, fluid animation, I found. Mm. Very very detailed as well. Very over detailed. And over. Um, I think they've had a good year because they've bought out one recently called Bocce the Rock that's doing quite well. But the animation is really good and mm. really fluid. And I, it really endears you to the characters more because I feel with a lot of series, anime series, they're kind of rushed out. And I think when the animation isn't on point, I think it might be something that sets up a good series. Because yeah, uh, what Dan Dan you know gave Cyberpunk as an example, and that also has really great animation. Yeah, I mean the aesthetics of Edge Runners is like. I'd say like forty percent of what makes the show just so enjoyable. Oh, yeah. It's so rich and vibrant. Um, you know, yeah. I just just looking through their list, they also did the animation everything for Bunny Girl Senpai, and they did Darling in the Franks. So well, there you go. It's um, I, they're one to watch. I think. I think yeah, uh, they are a very people. popular animation studio. Right. Well, uh, that wraps up the anime. Um, portion of this 2022 wrap up so we're on to the third and final segment for part two of the wrap up and that is books so just for the um, asterisk here books also covers audio books and to a degree podcasts as well if uh, you know so we're we're not just sticking to print books here so I'm going to start it off um, with a book that it turns out was actually got quite critically acclaimed which is the talisman by stephen king uh so the the basic setup is that a boy and his mother uh kind of go on holiday to a seaside town and by all accounts his mother seems to be dying and one day he um the boy meets a mysterious old man who kind of shows him how to access a parallel world it's all a little bit confusing but uh, and as it turns out in the parallel world he is the son of the king and queen and the queen is slowly dying and uh, basically sort of the rest of it is Jack the main character kind of learning how to travel to this alternate world which is a perfect parallel 
to this world except magic is real everything's a little bit smaller and it seems to sort of be medieval times but it's not it's uh it's hard to go into it too much without giving a lot away but it's it's quite an interesting premise and being written by stephen king of course it's not just a kind of you know fantasy sci-fi kind of thing it has a lot of like depth to it the characters are incredibly well written if you've read the book you'll know that wolf is hands down probably the best character in the entire book uh it's quite a long one it's about 800 pages or whatever but in that is basically an entire journey from like the east coast to the west coast i think of america and uh yeah it, it deals with quite a lot of different subjects and stuff and yeah honestly it's hands down probably one of king's best works it's also co-written by peter straub uh who's well known for his like fantasy stuff so i don't know exactly how it was how it was sort of split between the two authors i don't know if king wrote it with straub you know sort of suggesting things but yeah overall the talisman is just like it's an incredible book it's a long one but well worth the read does anyone else want to nominate their book slash audiobook slash whatever next all right uh i'll go ahead then cool uh so this is actually um a podcast um uh, i've read a lot of books but i felt like i had to make a mention of this because i've been listening to this all the time mm-hmm. and it's therapy gecko and it's like well okay well what is therapy gecko and it's a guy dressed up in a gecko outfit and uh and uh, goes out, uh, basically callers call in and they ask for advice or just talk and uh, and, and that's it really. And, but um, he, he, he emphasizes that he's not a real therapist and that if you do have actual problems, you should actually go see a therapist. But it's, um, you get all sorts of different callers and I think what, 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 what is captivating about this podcast is that it gets i think because people people find it hard to open up about things but i think if you're actually talking about a, you know you're talking to a guy in a costume it feels less serious you know, sort of less serious and yeah. i think because it's less serious people can open up as opposed to uh you know in a serious setting you know and it's sort of more like um like uh, it, uh, it, rather than actual counselling or things like that, it's you know kind of light-hearted in a way, and and I think as a result of that, people open up a lot more. But you do also get some really funny, uh, odd stories, and but you find that when you do listen to them, you you feel like oh, I've I've been in a scenario or experienced something like that. And then when they talk about it, it's like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't feel as bad or, you know, and it's something to relate to. So you do get a lot of that. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, and he goes, um, currently, uh, he's been traveling also in different parts of the world as well. And he goes around um, in an out, still wearing his outfit in these places. So, and the interviews just uh, sometimes he interviews random people on the street as well uh but you know he doesn't like force it or anything he lets mm. people come to them so it's not really confrontational um but um yeah you know almost honestly i i i uh i've been listening to that all the time as i said and sometimes they, they have celebrities um appear on the show and cool. um so you get all sorts of people calling they're thinking they're a vampire <laughs> or you know somebody thinks they're god or somebody saying their social skills are gone or you know just hmm. or i have amnesia or you know there's all sorts of things but it all so you see a unique setup unique the, uh... setup yeah and some some of them are kind of modern it's like oh my sister is addicted to virtual reality or something and they're just talking about that and and Hmm. And uh, yeah, honestly, it's um, it's very worth uh, listening to. They're also uh, it's also on, so it's on Spotify. It's also on Twitch. It's on YouTube as well. So 
Um, cool. So yeah, I would highly recommend that. And um, yeah, that's that's all I can say. Nice. Uh, would anyone like to nominate their choice for book slash audiobook slash podcast of 2022? Sure. I read shit this year. I'm so bad at reading books. Ooh. It's always one of my like New Year's resolutions. I'm going to read more, but I never do. Maybe next year. Maybe, maybe this time next year. Yeah. I'll make it yeah, one of my yeah. resolutions to have read a book. <laughs> Man, I'm really 30 and I'm still saying that. Okay, so my nomination is... It's a, it's a podcast. It's a podcast called Very Delta. Now, this podcast is about a lady called Delta Work. And what she does is she just goes on rants about, like, really stupid things, about, like, customer service in different restaurants. And um, she has this, like, ongoing beef with Subway. She didn't understand why they call them Subway artists because it makes it sound like you're going to get, like, a work of art, but actually you're just getting a sandwich. Um, so it is very much just this this lady called Delta Work going around um, having rants about really inane things, which I feel like is very relatable. She um well, she will complain about going to Starbucks and them not having any sugar free syrups for her drink, and um yeah that, it's it's very relatable. I feel like she is a woman of a lot of wisdom. She is a woman of a lot of whimsy, and we all need to listen to what Delta Work has to say. And I'm going to keep it short and sweet on that one. Sounds like a comfy listen. Therefore. Uh, right, you. Tom, would you like to nominate uh, your book slash audiobook slash podcast of 2022? Yes. Um, I'm going to keep it short and sweet as well because okay. I don't want to get overtly political. Um, odd. <laughs> yeah, or oh God. Um, but it's a podcast for me as well. And um, the podcast I'm choosing is one called Tisky Sour. So. It's um, a podcast by Navara Media, and it's about three times a week. And it tends to go over the news and stuff. Um, obviously, it's it's quite a left wing podcast, but um, it covers things like trade union action and stuff like that. They also have um, they have other shows as well, uh, where the talk about subjects from a left-wing perspective. One of the ones they recently did, which was really interesting to me, was on sleep and how we sleep a lot less these days um, and how that's a bad thing, how that is affecting our mm. life uh, with the general work habits of people and how people now now basically you know they do a loads of overtime and stuff which is unfortunately to do with the world we live in now where people need to earn the money but uh like i say, i'm gonna keep it short but it's a really interesting podcast and it tends to keep me well informed with a range of other news sources as well but uh it's a bit of a breath of fresh air for me so yeah that's my choice Cool. Well, that wraps up part two of the Talk Toys 2022 Wrapper podcast. Thank you guys very much for watching, and thank you guys very much for joining me for the podcast. Uh, keep an eye out. Tomorrow, we'll be covering the last three topics of our wrap-up of 2022. What will the topics be? <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't plan that far ahead. Fuck. Um, I'll see you guys for the next one tomorrow.